Well, well, we'll just get started here, and uh, and 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 once again, we'll we'll really lean into kind of the racial um, moment, the racial tension and racial justice moment that we find ourselves in. But we can ask all sorts of questions. But you you've broached on this already this morning, and just the intersection of emotional health as well as this conversation about racial justice and pursuing racial equity. Um, maybe even beyond just that one principle that you've talked about this morning, could you step back and just explore in, in broad brushstrokes how those two concepts intersect and how emotional health can empower and help us yeah. in pursuing this? Yeah, you know, when we talk about emotional health at New Life, uh, we talk about it in, um, in a few ways. Num number one, emotional health is about integrity. Uh, emotional health is about um, integration. And emotional health fundamentally is about loving well. Uh, loving ourselves well and loving our neighbor well. And so uh, usually in some circles, emotional health is about uh, growing in self-awareness and self-regulation for the sake of just being self-regulated when anxiety comes or growing in self-awareness, which are critically important things, stuff that I talk about all the time. But the goal of emotional health from a Christian perspective is not simply self-regulation and self-awareness. It is bringing that to bear for the sake of loving well. And so um, you could end, you, you could be self-aware and just be a self-aware jerk. I mean, that's the truth, okay? Um, but for the Christian, we wanna be self-aware and use that self-awareness, self-regulation, all that for the sake of loving well. So when we talk about race, it's not that emotional health is over here, race is over here. It's that the emotionally healthy person is recognizing that my chief task is to love my neighbor to love my neighbor as myself, which requires a level of now curiosity, humility, self-awareness, recognizing uh, my family of origin and the ways I've been shaped. And so all of the principles that you are uh, exploring through Pete's materials and such uh, is for the goal of being a more loving presence. And if we compartmentalize those things, um, you, you know, there are plenty of people who are self-regulated and racists. Okay, and self-aware and, um, you know, classist and, and all of the spectrum there. But the goal of it ultimately is uh, love. Now, the word integrity for me, when I, when my definition of integrity is this, integrity is not about living something perfectly, but about wrestling with something faithfully. That's my definition of integrity. Not living something perfectly, but wrestling with it faithfully. And that's what emotional health is doing. It's helping us to recognize and wrestle with my own stuff, my own unresolved pain. Why again? For the sake of my own wholeness and for the sake of, of loving well. So that's, that's my big picture uh, combination of how, how do they converge? It's because of love. Awesome. Is there also a role to, um, I know some people just get really worked up and I've heard so many people have said, you know, gosh, I'm just exhausted. And there's a lot there in that why you're exhausted, but maybe particularly those who are, are maybe starting to, to get attuned to this conversation. Can you speak to about the um, principles of emotional health setting us up for not just a few weeks of activism or, or anything, yeah. but a lifelong journey towards, towards this moment. Yeah. You know, a lot of people have come up to me, uh, you know, it, uh, you know, another way of looking at it, uh, how I've tried to frame this is, you know, that emotional health is about paying attention to your inner space and your outer pace, inner space and outer pace. And again, that's just, I mean, stuff that rhymes, I mean, just, just sounds nice too. Uh, but it's what the interior world, as well as your outer pace. Now, uh, it's often the case I've gotten the last two weeks have been incredibly full because of the moment that we're in. And I've spoken to a lot of pastor friends and podcasts and Zooms and all that. And um, the first thing I've told people who are starting to wade into this world is number one, to have a long view of this. This is not something that came yesterday and is not something that's going to be done with tomorrow. This is a long journey. And so um, people have asked me, you know, how are you doing, Rich? And I'm thinking, how are your rhythms? 
And for me, uh, I've been practicing Sabbath keeping for 12 years, every Friday night, 6 p.m. to Saturday night, 6 p.m. And they said, how are your rhythms? And I said, I'm still doing Sabbath. <laughs> I'm still keeping Sabbath. Uh, our, we have had intense moments all the time. And, and I am not just doing this because I want to be selfish here. I'm looking at Jesus as my model. Mark 6.31. Mark 6.31, it says Jesus that he was with his disciples and it was so full that he did not have even the opportunity to eat. And what he do? He said, let's get away. And I always am curious when I see Jesus, he's healing people. He's healed, let's just say a hundred people. And then 101 comes. And then he says, let's get away. And I always grieve number one, because wow, that, what if that was my kid? 101 and Jesus has to leave now. So I grieve there, but at the same time, the larger picture is Jesus recognizes that unless we have a rhythm of presence and absence, that's Henry Nouwen's phrase, we need a ministry of presence and we need a ministry of absence. If we don't cultivate both of them, we're gonna find ourselves uh, burned out. We're gonna find ourselves without the interior tools. Let me tell you something Pete Scazzera, my, my ment predecessor and mentor told me, I, I never forget, he said to me, as we were, I was being interviewed for the job to be an assistant pastor in 2008, not knowing I would actually succeed him, but we're at this diner eating grilled cheese sandwiches and French fries and all that. And at the middle of the conversation with the French fry hanging out my mouth, you know, he goes, do you know the only way you'll get fired here? And, you know, I sat up very straight, almost choked on my French fry. And I said, well, let me pay attention here. And he goes, the only way you'll get fired from this church is if you don't practice Sabbath. And I thought, that's very strange. Uh, I came from cultures and church cultures that said, if you don't work, or corporate, corporate cultures that says, if you don't work, you're going to get fired. But this guy was saying, if you don't keep Sabbath. And then he said, I said, why is that? And he said, because if you don't keep Sabbath, you won't have the interior life that's deep enough to sustain your work as a pastor. And I think that is the call for the moment we're in right now. We need to take the long view. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, I've come back to this other passage as well, Tim, where Jesus casts out a demon. And then he says, if you don't fill this house, uh, seven other demons are going to come stronger. And the latter is going to be worse than the former. And I think we're in a moment right now where there's some churches that are spending all their time denouncing racism and we are not about this. We're not about that. They're denouncing it. But here's the problem. They're going to turn it into a three-week sermon series. Mm -hmm. And think, we did the sermon series. We had the panel. We're great. Now let's move on to something else. No, th th this message of racism is not, uh, th this is core to the gospel. Uh, and the gospel is about God making a new, the risen Jesus is creating a new family. So I think take the long view. And part of that is our rhythms. Part of that is humble listening, uh, a view of the gospel, which for me, it all relates some way and somehow to our emotional health. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Um, we got a question from, from Sarah, actually, and I hope I get this right, but it's basically on emotionally healthy listening, but also with boundaries. Yeah. She said, I've had experiences of stepping out of my world and into others and was wrongly manipulated and controlled in that process. How do we integrate self-kindness, wisdom, but also good boundaries in the process of listening well? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I would obviously have to learn a little bit more about the condition there, the situation, the context. Um, if, if, I mean, again, if the manipulation, again, I, I would have to learn more about power dynamics, uh, was the person who she was listening to a person in authority who manipulated her? Um, it was this a person because again, if that's the case, the person in power, uh, there's a divestment that needs to take place, especially in moments of conflict. Like my primary task as a pastor is to, is to do the hard work of listening. This is not easy. Um, so I would have to, I'm sorry, I can't really give a good response to that because I think there's, there are different variables that are, uh, connected to that. Um, but, you know, if, if the person you are listening to, um, or any kind is, if there's marked by manipulation, I mean, then I think the next thing you should do is 
you know, find someone else and process that with someone else and not necessarily put yourself in a position, especially if you perceive you're being manipulated. Um, I, so I think those boundaries are absolutely important for those moments. So, yeah, and sorry, that was, uh, that was me, Jesse, Sarah's my wife, but oh. <laughs> hey, you're, you're, uh, yeah, your, your point, it was, it was, it's more in the context of people who are kind of in a, a mentoring or leadership position where I would sort of be stepping out of my world and kind of going into theirs, but didn't realize that I was, I was getting formed into something that wasn't healthy in that case. Yeah. And I kind of used the, I mean, the thing that kind of brought me there was, oh, well, you know, when you're stepping into someone's world, like you're going to be uncomfortable and that's yeah. potentially true, but maybe you're uncomfortable because the person you're listening to is actually not being healthy and not having a good influence. Yeah. So it's more in that kind of leadership yeah. sort of position. Yeah. All of this, I mean, I, if I were to, uh, Tom, I would say if, if I was planting a church, one of the first things that I would have everyone study and reflect on is on differentiation because the core of emotional health and Pete, I mean, Pete, I mean, this guy's the master behind it and I've worked under him for 12 years. So I, I think I, um, I have something to say here. The goal of all of the emotion is differentiation. Differentiation very simply is this, you holding on to yourself or while, or you remaining close to yourself while remaining close to others in a time of high anxiety. And, with, and resisting the pull of doing two things. One, being enmeshed in that person where their ideas become your ideas and there's no separation, or you cutting off. And, uh, and I, mean, I, I mean, I could do a whole thing on David and Goliath in this year, uh, but differentiation. So I, I just think in terms of listening, how do we become higher differentiated where we can hold on to ourselves while hold, being close to others? Um, I think it's an area that, it's, pro it's for me, when I train my staff, it's one of the areas I come back to annually about how do we grow in differentiation together. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, I go, Peter has another question on the similar topic. Do you have any tangible examples of how to leave your world and enter someone else's? What does that look like practically? And let me tell you, I'll give you my, my, my own stories here. Um, very recently, uh, last, last year, we had a gospel and race conference, and I'll connect this all to racism as well. Um, we had a gospel and race conference. Every year we bring in uh, scholars and practitioners from around the country to spend two to three days with us to talk about this, and we invite leaders from the area. And we did it last year. It was brilliant, wonderful uh, reflections, teachings, and then a week later, I got an email from one of our uh, black congregants who said, uh, a few of us want to get together because we don't feel seen here. Now, again, New Life, 75 nations represented. To give you the thrust of it, I would say 30% are Pan-Asian, so Asian-American, Asian, and from all, you know, all over. I would say a third Latin American and U.S. Latino. I would say uh, 20%, 25 black african-american and then uh you know 10 percent white and then other okay uh and uh so i was first of all i was very what do you mean we put these gospel and race things together our staff is incredibly diverse uh, you know the second in command is a black woman i mean what are we talking about here and uh at first i was very tempted to just say send me an email and i'll respond via email whatever i didn't want to listen <laughs> Uh, and I realized, no, this is a moment. And so seven of them gathered together. And what it looked like very pr practically for me is um, I had a notepad and a pencil. And I just said, um, can you please help me understand what's impacting you, what's bothering you? And for about an hour, I listened, taking notes, and then gave some feedback here and there. Uh, but I think very practically, depending on, again, the dynamics at, the, at work, the power dynamics, but the goal is how can I be, uh, now, th don't get me wrong, when I was doing that, I wasn't like so open and like, oh, Lord, you're speaking to me right now. This is so wonderful. I'm like disagreeing with them in my mind. I'm all like, oh, Lord, you know, I had a cup of coffee. I'm hiding behind, you know, just to, to get me to do something. These are not easy, but for me, I think it, it means curiosity, a, a willingness to 
uh, to truly step into someone else's shoes. And for me, very practically, it's, would you mind if I just capture certain things here? Because I don't want to miss it. Uh, so that's what it looks like for me. And my, my, my wife, and, I just, and I'll just give you a marriage one as well. Um, I have failed repeatedly. At the same time, I see myself making good progress. And my own progress with my wife is in my own ability to take deep breaths, number one, not like in front of her, like, <sighs> you know, not, not those kind of exhale breaths, but just like <laughs> recognizing my body. And Lord, I want to be present to her. And I recognize there's stuff that's coming up. Uh, and sometimes, I mean, I have to say, honey, very practical, you know, could you just give me a, a minute or so so I can just get in a better space? Because I do want to be present with you. And I realize there's some stuff is coming up in me that's unresolved. Uh, and so, you know, all of these different things, this is a lifelong work. Um, but I think growing in self-awareness is really critical to being present with other people. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> it's awesome. All right, we got uh, probably enough time for just a couple more questions. I got one here. Uh, it's been said true wisdom and maturity is knowing when to listen, when you should listen, and then when to speak up, when you should speak up. Um, could, so could you walk through what this model of incarnational love would say to us in those instances where we feel like we need to speak up and quote, speak the truth in love, to quote Paul? Yeah, if it's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation, uh, again, incarnational listening is not about resolution. Incarnational listening is not about problem solving. Incarnational listening is not about um, debating. Incarnational listening. Now, there is a time to say, hey, can we have a, um, can I, you know, can I respond back? Can we, you know, we have plenty of tools at emotionallyhealthy.org. And so whether it's climbing the ladder of integrity, whether it's clean fighting, whatever it is, stuff that we've used. But the goal of incarnational listening is not now to speak. <laughs> <laughs> the goal is to be present to them. And there is a time, that's, that's another skill for another time. The goal here though is, what does it mean to be present to their presence, to listen humbly and curiously? Um, and there is a time to speak, but um, I think what we can all learn and do better at is, what does it mean for me to listen? Dallas Willard, I never forgot it. Um, and I think I got this from John Ortberg, who I've heard him say, that uh, there was a, Dallas Willard was a philosophy professor at UN, USC and uh, John Ortberg talks about a time where he, uh, Willard was giving a lecture and a student um, uh, had some, you know, sarcasm for him and, and all that. And instead of responding to the student, Willard said, you know, let's end the class here. And Ortberg said, you could have crushed that student. Why didn't you crush him? And uh, Dallas Willard said, I'm practicing the discipline of not having the last word. Yeah. Now, God help us, okay? <laughs> because I want the last word. But I think incarnational listening is for that purpose, is not to have the last word. It's to be a present, to be a presence to, a, to another person's presence. Uh, and um, so there's other skills for that and other times, but I think if we're gonna dive deep into this, it's what does it mean to really be attentive to another person's presence and really feel what they feel and hear what's really going on in their soul. So good. Thank you. Um, well, I'll try to end maybe here and Phil, um, you asked a few questions. I'll try to kind of combine them together. But, um, but basically San Francisco is a, is a diverse city, but we've actually noticed there's, there's not, um, there's pockets where actually, there's not actually that much diversity um, if you like really zoom in, there's just pockets. And even us starting out as a new church plant, you know, uh, most of us would come from us, you know, the majority world, majority culture. And how do we, how, how do we, as we're getting started, you know, you mentioned New Life has 75 nations represented. Wow. How do we elevate other voices? Wow. How do we also, and then participate in um, being an active agent of racial reconciliation and uh, justice as we're just getting started from our position right now? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd say that um, making, it, it is possible for churches to make diversity into an idol. And I think we have to resist that pull. Uh, diversity is a gift. 
diversity is, um, you know, Revelation 7, 9, you know, at, at the end of human history, you know, every tribe, tongue, nation, all that there. And so it's a gift. Um, what I would say is um, a church that wants to move down the road of greater reconciliation across racial, cultural, social lines and such and justice. I think the, before diversity, there needs to be a commitment to solidarity uh, because you can be very diverse and not work for justice. There are plenty of very diverse churches in this country that are not, that are not, um, there are more plantations than they are communities and families of Jesus working for justice. And so I, for me, a diverse church doesn't mean anything in terms of your work for justice. It just means maybe your demographics can work better on your side to, to create that. So I do think representation is important. I do think who's on the stage, who's preaching, who has power, who's shaping the culture of a community needs to be diverse, ideally. Uh, but I think, and I think that has its place. Our entire staff, if you go on our website, you'll see how incredibly diverse our staff is. That's very intentional. Um, so how we make decisions, who's on staff, who's, on, who's not, we, we realize who's not at the table and how do we make space for that voice, for that story, for that history. And so it's often the case that we have waited to hire someone because we recognize there's someone missing at the table and we, we need to wait until God sends us that right person. Uh, and, and so, but solidarity, I think is the most important thing. And by solidarity, I mean, how do we join our voices and join our lives to others who have been marginalized? How do we join our voices in our lives to those who have been, uh, the recipients of injustice? Because you could be, here's the, the it'll blow your mind. You can be an all white church and have solidarity and you can be an all multi-ethnic church and not have any solidarity. And um, I don't think it's a matter of either or, but how do we hold these two in dynamic tension with one another? So I would say that the goal is solidarity. How do we raise our voices for people who are on the margins? I think that's what Jesus would do. I think that's Matthew 25 and the entirety of Jesus's ministry. Uh, and so let's start there. And then who's at the table, who needs to be at the table? And by God's grace, let's pray that God will send someone and help us to pursue people to uh, diversify our congregation in the best sense of that word, not tokenism, but in the best sense of that word. Yeah. Well, I think we could keep going on forever. There's lots of questions I didn't get to. Thank you everyone for participating in jumping in and thank you again, Rich, for, um, Thanks for having me. investing in our, in our, our church plant here. Uh, and so I got to say, I have, for whatever reason, God has, uh, connected me to many churches in San Francisco these days. And so whether it's reality, whether it's epic, whether it's you guys here, um, wow. uh, there, there's something happening in San Francisco and I love it. And my hope is that in New York, we have wonderful relationships with other pastors and churches. There's a real camaraderie we have in New York City with, it, with the body of Christ. And my hope is that San Francisco has the same thing because we need each other in these moments. Yeah, absolutely. Oh.